Father, this morning, would you help us to see the life that you give us in Christ? <coughs> would you help us to know that what you give us is so much better than what this world offers us? God, I pray that the preaching of your word this morning, that our hearts will be stirred and that we will love you more than we walk in. Father, would you speak to us now? We are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, would you meet with me in John chapter 8? John's Gospel chapter 8 will be in verses 12 through 30 this morning as we continue our series through the I Am statements. In John's Gospel, we come to the second I Am statement in John 8, 12 through 30. If you didn't know this, Fallon, Nevada is the arsenic capital of America. According to the Chicago Tribune, the Environmental Protection Agency found that Fallon's water system delivers more arsenic to its customers than any other large town water system. The people there actually joke about it. They say arsenic, eh, it only bothers you if you're not used to it. And Tim Miller, who's lived there his whole life, joked and said, arsenic is no biggie. I'll die of something. It's called life. Once you're born, you start dying. You see, the arsenic levels remain high there, not because people like drinking arsenic, but because they don't want to pay for the solution. A $10 million treatment plan. And one official explained this by saying, this is Nevada. They don't want to feel the government intruding on anything in their lives. So they're going to keep drinking the arsenic. And really when you think about it, they didn't want the government intruding in their lives. And that's really what happens in church when we talk about sin. We kind of resist that because we don't want anyone telling us how to live our lives, even God. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. We want to believe that we're just fine. We might even have the kind of attitude that communicates with the people of Fallon said that, well, sin's really no biggie. I'll die of something. It's called life. See, we don't like in our own flesh, our own desires, we don't like people to tell us what to do. I don't know about you, but I don't like it. I'm sure no one here likes to be told what to do. And it's not that we don't want to get rid of our sin. It's not that we don't want to be free of our sin. We just don't want anyone to tell us how to get rid of our sin. We'll take care of it ourselves. We want to feel like we're free. We want to feel like that we are the ones who get to choose how we live our lives. But there is the problem. If we have unchecked sin in our life, we are not listening to what God says when it comes to de dealing with our sin. We can't actually live the life that he has created and saved us to live. We can't. You see, we like to believe that uh, we want to live free of influence. We want to live free of what anyone else tells us to do. But the reality is when you live in the desires of your flesh, when you live just kind of making your own choices, not letting anyone else tell you what to do, you're not actually free of influence there. You're actually being influenced by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Because they don't want you to live a fulfilling and meaningful life. They want to keep you in your sin. They want to keep you right where you, are, where you are. So that way you live aimlessly. So that way you live without purpose. You live without meaning. They want your life filled with defeat, with addictions, and with depression. That's what they want for you. And when you think that, well, I'm just making these choices... You're being influenced by someone and something that doesn't have your best interest in mind. That's not living life. But you see, the very person that we don't like to tell us how to live, the very God who gives us a standard to live by, we think it's restricting, we think that it limits us, but the reality is it's only by following this God, it's only by loving him that we are truly free to live the life that he created us to live. A life of purpose, a life of meaning, a fulfilling life. It only comes from the author of life. It does not come apart from him. And so you and I as believers, we need to understand that if we want to live as we were created and saved to live, then we have to embrace the one who gives 
light, we have to understand what it means for him to be the light of the world. We have to understand what John 8, verses 12 through 30 tells us. Because in this passage, Jesus delivers his second I am statement. And it reveals this, that he has come to lead those who believe out of the kingdom of darkness and into his kingdom. Since he is the light of the world and he gives true and meaningful and fulfilling life to those who believe. And here's the reality. You and I can live that life today. You and I can walk and live this life if we will embrace and follow the light of the world. So with this in mind this morning, let's look at John chapter 8, verses 12 through 30. Jesus says, Jesus spoke to them again and said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not valid. Even if I testify about myself, Jesus replied, my testimony is true because I know where I came from and where I am going. But you don't know where I came from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. And if I do judge, my judgment is true because it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it is written the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Then they asked him, Where is your Father? You know neither me nor my Father, Jesus answered. If you knew me, you would also know my Father. He spoke these words by the treasury while teaching in the temple, but no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Then he said to them again, I'm going away. You will look for me, and you will die in your sin." Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said again, he, he won't kill himself, will he? Since he says where I'm going, you cannot come? You are from below, he told them. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore I told you that you will die in your sins, for you do not believe that I am he. You will die in your sins. Who are you? They questioned. Exactly what I've been telling you from the very beginning, Jesus told them. I have many things to say and to judge about you, but the one who sent me is true. And what I've heard from him, these things I tell the world. They did not know he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And that I do nothing on my own, which is what the Father taught me, I say these things. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Because I always do what pleases him. Then listen to verse 30. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. In this passage this morning, we see two actions of the light in our lives that should lead us to want to embrace and follow him. And the first is that the light exposes our darkness. The light exposes our darkness. Jesus begins here by saying, I am the light of the world. And how would they understand that? How would a first century Jewish listener understand that? Well, they would understand that throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, light and darkness have a deeper meaning. Yes, they literally mean light and darkness, but light represents life, represents the presence of God and salvation. Darkness represents sin and destruction. So Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. They would have immediately thought of Psalm 27 verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? They would have thought of that. So Jesus, remember, when he says, I am, he is saying that he is God. And what he says following proves that he's God. So he is saying, I am the light of the world. I am the salvation you're looking for. I am the one you've been waiting for. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And this isn't the only time John has referred to Jesus or God as light. And he does so in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, as we read earlier. Let me read them to you again. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him. And apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, 
and yet the darkness did not overcome it. So what's John saying there? He's saying this, that Jesus is this light. He is the one who gives life, and sin and destruction have not overtaken him. That sin and destruction do not defeat him, but he overcomes them. That he is greater than them. So when John says this, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he is saying, I am the one who gives salvation. I am the one who conquers the darkness. I am the one who defeats the enemy, who brings about his enslavement to darkness. Jesus is making a mighty declaration here. But what do, what do the Pharisees do? The Pharisees that he's talked to before, that in the previous chapter, chapter 7, he's already talked to them. And here in chapter 8, verses uh, 1 through 11, we have the story of the woman caught in adultery. And then we come to this, and Jesus is talking to the Pharisees again. And Jesus makes this, this bold declaration. He says, I am the light of the world. And what do the Pharisees do? Your testimony isn't valid. What you say can't be true. Because you're testifying about yourself. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't need anyone to tell me when the lights are on in the house. I just know it. Light testifies about itself. Jesus doesn't need two or three witnesses. He is the light. He testifies about himself. And what is he doing here? He's exposing the darkness of the Pharisees. He's exposing the darkness of their hearts. Why? Because he declares that he is the one that they're waiting for. And they say, your testimony isn't valid. That doesn't count. What you said is not true. Because in our law, because of Deuteronomy 17, 6, in order for any charge to be established, there must be two or three witnesses. And you don't have that. He's exposing their darkness. He's exposing that while they consider themselves righteous, they consider themselves to be the people of God, they're missing the very one God had sent. Because they're in the darkness. And Christ is exposing that. So how does Jesus respond when they accuse him of this? He says, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true because I know where I come from and where I'm going. But you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. And if I do judge, my judgment is true because it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. So Jesus once again is exposing their darkness. He's saying, look, I testify about myself. My testimony is true. And here's the reality. You judge by fleshly, worldly standards, and that's wrong. You don't care about what God cares about. You don't judge the way our Heavenly Father does. Your judgment is skewed. Your judgment is wrong. You judge by worldly or fleshly standards. I judge no one by that standard. We actually see this in the Old Testament when we look at the story of David. You know, Samuel goes to find the Lord's anointed. He goes to find the one that he says will be the next king. And he looks at all of David's brothers, the ones who were bigger than him, the ones who looked like they would be kings. And Samuel kept going to them. And the Lord said, no, no, no. And then David, this shepherd boy. And God says, I judge the heart. I don't evaluate what the world says I should. That's what Jesus is saying here. I don't judge by your worldly and perfect standards. I judge the hearts of men. I judge them. I'm able to judge them because I know the hearts of men. This is why Jesus is able to expose our darkness because he knows what really lies in our hearts. The Pharisees try to cover up their darkness. They try to show that we're righteous. Everything they do, they do for show. They're trying to show off the people. They're trying to show that I am the righteous one of God. But then Jesus says, no, your heart is really dark. Because you don't know me. Because you don't believe in me. Your heart is dark. And he proves this when he says in verses 17 through 18. Even in your law it is written, the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies about myself and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Listen to verse 19. Where is your father? You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would also know my father. And this is significant. Because later on in this chapter, the Pharisees and Jesus are going to keep debating. The tensions are going to rise. It's going to get really hostile for, for, for them. At the very end of this conversation, they're actually going to pick up stones to stone Jesus. And they do so because they start having a, well, my dad can beat up your dad kind of competition towards the end. 
The Pharisees say, well, we are children of God. And Jesus says, no, you're not. You're children of the devil. Which is just a great way to start any conversation. <laughs> and they say, well, we're, we're children of Abraham. And Jesus goes, no, you're not. You do the works of your father, the devil. Because if you knew Abraham, if he was your father, you would know me. So Jesus, they're about to have this great debate. And already Jesus is showing that they don't really know the father they claim to know. They don't know the one who has sent him. He's exposing their darkness. He's exposing that they aren't righteous. He's exposing they don't really know God. They just know about his law. And they even look at the law wrongly because if they really understood the law, they would know the one the law points to. And they're missing it. So what Jesus is doing here, he's exposing their darkness. He's exposing the real reality of their heart, that they are not a righteous people, but they are trapped and enslaved to the darkness. But he's not just exposing the Pharisees as the light of the world. He's exposing our darkness, too. It reminds me of this. Uh, when I was a kid, I had a really paranoid uh, phobia, almost, of the dark. I say as a kid, I was a preteen. I was like 13. I was like, with night lights? Don't judge me. But I was terrified of the dark. Noises at night that I, that I would have heard them during the day, I wouldn't have thought of, terrified me. I thought, there is a monster under my bed, or there is someone around the corner about to get me. I hated the darkness. I hated it, so what did I do? I didn't get one, but two nightlights. One that I plugged into the wall, and then a really cool one that spun around and had dinosaur cutouts on it, so there's dinosaurs all over my room. thing was awesome. Still kind of wish I had it at times. Anyway... But when those night lights were on, I wasn't scared anymore. Why? Because when the lights were on, I saw that there was nothing in the darkness that could hurt me. It was exposed. What was hidden in the dark was no longer hidden. In the same way, the light of the world is exposing our dark darkness in order to expose what we're hiding in the dark. Because we all do it. We all hide things in the dark. These pet sins or these hidden sins that we might try to fool other people. We might have our spouses fooled. We might have our families fooled. We might have our friends or our coworkers fooled. But we can't fool Jesus. He exposes that darkness. He exposes what is hidden in that darkness. And that is both an uncomfortable and a comforting truth. It's uncomfortable because that means that Jesus knows even the deepest darkness of our hearts. It's uncomfortable because we know that Jesus knows the very wicked sin that we're addicted to or that we're holding on to. But it's comforting because even though he knows that, if you're a believer, he's not casting you out. Even though he knows just how dark your heart really is, he's not condemning you. He's calling you to bring it to the light. He's exposing your darkness. He's exposing what is hidden in the darkness. So you will take it and bring it to the light. He's not doing it to make fun of you. He's not doing it to bring you down or to make you feel defeated. He is doing that so that you can get rid of it to really live the life he has saved you to live. To live a fulfilling life, to live a meaningful life. And you cannot do that when there is still sin hid in the darkness. Because you know what sin does in the darkness? It grows. You do not have a handle on your sin like you think you do. It grows in the darkness. And the destruction it's going to cause, or it will cause, grows too. And it's easy for us to not think about, because there are often times where we have this hidden sin and nothing's going wrong. But understand this, you're sinning on credit, and eventually the bill comes due. And the longer you hide it in the dark, the more destructive it gets. So don't hide it in the dark. Jesus exposes our darkness. He exposes what is hidden in the darkness so we may bring it to the light. And how do we do that? How do we respond to that? Well, what I'm about to ask you to do is going to make you really uncomfortable. It's going to warn you right now. You weren't meant to fight your sin alone. Jesus is exposing what you're hiding in the darkness so you'll take it and bring it to the light with somebody you trust. He does that so you'll take that sin you're struggling with, that sin that you can't overcome, and you'll bring it to somebody. You'll tell somebody that you trust, another believer, and say, I can't do this alone. 
That's why he exposed what's hidden in the darkness. Because we as a church, we as believers, we weren't meant to fight sin alone. The church is not just a bunch of individuals. The church is a body made up of individuals. I said that wrong. Individuals. That's what the church is made up of. We were meant to come together. We were meant to share all things in common. We were meant to be in each, to tell each other what we're struggling to say. Carry this burden with me. That's what the church is for. And if we have a sin that we're hiding in the darkness, if we have something that we're not bringing to the light that's killing us, that's destroying us, then we need to tell somebody, I can't do this on my own. Will you help me? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen for the rest of this sermon, obviously. But here in a few, mo- a few minutes, we are going to have an invitation. And I would be a fool to think that in a room this size, that there is not someone in here dealing with a hidden or pet sin that's destroying your life. I want you to do something to make you a little uncomfortable. During our invitation, I want you to grab someone that you trust. I don't want you to ask them to come to the altar and pray with you. Because you can't fight this battle alone. But here's the good news. Our paranoid fear of people judging us or rejecting us, any true believer isn't going to do that to you. So find someone you trust. Jesus is exposing what is hidden in the darkness so that you will bring it to the light. And so bring it to the light this morning. Tell someone you're struggling. Tell someone that you need them to pray with you. Don't keep trying to maintain it. It's just going to destroy you more. You see, because Jesus exposes our darkness, the light exposes our darkness, he exposes what is hidden in the darkness in order that he may lead us out of the darkness. That's what the light does. The light leads us out of darkness. That's what we see in verses 21 through 30. You see, he says, I'm going away. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. And that's kind of an odd statement for Jesus to kind of say after everything else already being said. Even the Jews are confused. He won't kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, we talked about how at face value, any first century listener would have understood Jesus to be fulfilling Psalm 27, verse 1, when he says, I'm the light of the world. But there is a deeper meaning that the Pharisees would have understood they were missing. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, what it came to mind was Exodus 13 and 14. When God leads his people out of the land of their affliction, he leads them out of Egypt by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Jesus is saying this when he says, I'm the light of the world. I am the light of the world. I am a true and better pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, leading my people out of their land of affliction, out of their enslavement, out of the domain of darkness, and leading them to an eternal kingdom. Jesus is saying, I am leading a true and better exodus. Jesus is saying, I am leading my people not just out of physical enslavement, but out of spiritual enslavement. I am leading them out of the land that is destroying them. I am leading them out of the land that they are enslaved to. I am leading them out of that and leading them to a better life, an eternal life, one in right relationship with God. That's what Jesus is declaring there. He's saying, where I'm going, you cannot come. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. Why? That's what he says in verse 23. I am above, you are, up, I, you are from below, I am, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus right there told them what their biggest problem was. Why can they not go where Jesus is going? Why are they not being led by Jesus out of the kingdom of darkness and into his kingdom? Because they don't believe and that's really the theme of John's gospel, as I said last week. The theme of John's gospel is he wrote these things so that people may believe and live. You want to live? You want to live the life that God has saved you to live? Then believe. You want to be free from your sin, freed from the enslavement that you're under in your sin? You want to be led out of the kingdom of darkness? Then believe. That's what Jesus is saying. There's no work that you do. There's nothing that you have to do. There's no righteousness you muster up to be led on this exodus. All you need to do is believe. That's it. Believe that Jesus is the one who does these things. Believe that he is who he says he is. Believe that he is truly able to lead you out of darkness and lead you into the kingdom of light and lead you into his eternal kingdom. Believe. That's what the light does. 
If you want to live a fulfilling and meaningful life, then believe. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. Believe. He's telling the Pharisees, you will die in your sins because you don't believe. Those are the options. Believe and live or die in unbelief. Believe and be led out of the kingdom of darkness or don't believe and die in the kingdom of darkness. That's the choice between every single person who's ever lived. Believe and live or don't believe and die in your sin. And we might think that's a hard calling, but if you really think about it, belief isn't something that comes unnatural to us. We believe in plenty of things every single day, whether true, false, or unproven. For example, I believe that Bigfoot is real and that he's a majestic creature that we need to leave alone. Don't judge me. There's proof. I believe he's real. And you may not believe something that extravagant, but you believe when you wake up in the morning that your car is going to take you to work and back. You believe that tonight the sun is going to set and it's going to rise again like it always does. Belief doesn't come unnatural to us. But when it comes to believing the promises of Jesus, when it comes to believing who Jesus is, we find it difficult because we know that when we believe in Jesus, we're going to be led out of a place we might be comfortable with. We might be led out of a place that we're already comfortable with. But here's the problem. The place that we're comfortable with is the very place that's killing us. The sin that we're comfortable with, the flesh that we're comfortable with, those hidden sins that we're comfortable with, they're destroying us. Why would we want to remain there? Why would you want to remain in a place that's destroying you, that's leaving you empty and unfulfilled? Why would you not want to be led to a true and better life? Yes, believing in Jesus is going to lead you out of your comfort zone. Yes, it's going to lead you out of what you're comfortable with, but it's leading you to a better place. And all we need to do is believe. As believers, it doesn't mean that we need to daily believe and be saved every single day because, you know, what's saved always saved. We believe that. So what are we believing in? Well, daily as believers, it means that we daily believe in the promises of Christ. That we believe that no matter how bad that day is, no matter how bad we mess up that day, that Jesus isn't going to cast us out. We believe that even in the midst of our worst darkness, that he's able to lead us out and lead us to the other side. We believe that he will never lead us to a place where his grace will not sustain us. We believe that he will lead us to a place that is greater than whatever we ask or think. We believe that he, while he is leading us to the new heaven and the new earth where death is no more, where sickness is no more, where pain is no more, we believe that as he's leading us there, we already have the best thing about eternity. We already have Jesus. We believe those things and daily we need to believe them so that we're not led back in the kingdom of darkness so we don't go to what we're comfortable with so that we go with the one who leads us to life. So we go with the one who gives what we're really looking for. We go to the one who gives us purpose. We go to the one who gives us meaning. We need to daily believe in the promises of Jesus and that he is leading us to a place better than wherever we're at right now. We need to believe. Because that is where our hope is found. That is where our joy is found. It's not in the world. It's in the promises of Christ. So you believe we have to daily believe. We have to daily want to be rid of sin and closer to Jesus. We have to understand and we have to believe that the more comfortable we get with Jesus, the more uncomfortable we're going to get with our sin. We also have to know the flip side of that. That the more comfortable we get with our sin, the more uncomfortable we will be with Jesus. But Jesus leads us out of what we're comfortable with into what is true and what is better. And we need to believe that. And if you're not a believer, you need to believe and be saved. You need to believe that Jesus lived the life that you never could, that he was tempted and tried as you were, and yet he was without sin. You need to believe that on that cross when he said it is finished, that that meant that the full cup of God's wrath was poured upon him and that he died for your sins, that every sin, past, present, and future has been atoned for at the cross, has been dealt with, and that you need to believe that on the cross, when you believe that Jesus is able to wash you clean of all sin, you need to believe that he did rise from the grave three days later, and that because of his resurrection, we must believe that he is able, and he raises us to walk in the newness of life. When you want to boil down the Christian life to one word, it's believe. Believe that Jesus is able to do 
all things that he says he's going to do. Believe he's the light of the world. Believe that he is the one who exposes our darkness so we will bring what's hidden in the darkness into the light. Believe that he does that in order to lead us out of the darkness. Believe that he is the true and greater exodus leading us out of what has truly enslaved us. We have to believe. And so the question before us this morning, the question before us every single day is will we believe? Will we believe? And if we will, then we will be able to live the life that he has saved us to live. A life of purpose, a life of meaning, a fulfilling life. But that requires us to believe. To believe that his grace is sufficient. And that what I asked you to do earlier about getting somebody, having them pray to an invitation, is believing that if Jesus has saved them, they won't cast you out either. Because this morning we all have things that we're carrying. We all have stuff we want to hide in the darkness. But don't hide it in the darkness any longer. Jesus has come to lead you out of the darkness. So if you do have that sin, if you do have something that is killing you, that is destroying you, that you're trying to deal with but you just can't seem to deal with, here in a few moments we are going to have a time of invitation. And I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to make you feel uncomfortable. But I promise you, if you'll do it, you will save your life. Grab someone that you trust. You don't have to tell them right then and there what you're struggling with, but have them come to the front and pray with you. And let that be a verbal commitment that after the service is over, you're going to meet with them and talk to them. Any true brother and sister in Christ would love to be that person for you. Don't hide in the darkness any longer. Believe in the promises of Jesus. Believe that he will not cast you out. Believe that he does this for your betterment. Believe that he does this to give you a better life. And if you're not a believer in here, during our invitation, I'm going to be at the front. Would you come and believe and be saved this morning? Jesus is the light of the world. The question we have to answer is, will we embrace him and live the life that he has saved us to live? Let's pray together this morning. God, you are so good and gracious to us. You give us life when we don't deserve it. You give us grace when we desperately need it. And God, this morning I pray that we will be quick to come to you. That we'll be quick to believe and live this morning. I believe that we will believe and live the life that you have saved us to live. And as um, and there's an unbeliever in here, that they will believe and live and have eternal life in a renewed and restored relationship with you. God, would you help us to believe this morning? Would you help us to embrace the light of the world? Would you help us to believe? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You come this morning as the Lord leads you.